Corruption festers in the shadows of bureaucracy, a disease veiling itself behind the opaque windows of city offices and the crafted smiles of officials. Systems built to protect and serve now do neither, instead lining the pockets of those who know the right hands to shake. This project site sh shines a harsh light on these shadowed corners, wielding transparency as a weapon, demanding accountability where there has been none. Here, technology and strategy converge, revealing the fingerprints left in the margins hastily. Signed documents and quiet deletions from public records. The machine doesn't sleep. It doesn't get bribed. It doesn't forget. It watches. It records. It reports. With the initiatives launched, with the precisions of a well-aimed arrow, cutting through the usual red tape and tape alike. It targets the heart of inefficiency, leveraging robust data and incorruptible blockchain to restore integrity. The plans unfold in stages, each meticulously crafted to build upon the last, forming a fortress of accountability. Resources once squandered now fuel the system where waste is hunted and expunged, engagement strategies transform passive observers into active participants, guardians of their own rights and resources. The pilot phase is merely the beginning. A proof of concept is one city that will integrate a nationwide transformation. Efficiency isn't just an ideal. It becomes the standard. This is just the first of a couple of messages that are requirements to be heard along the way. Mayor Bass, there is no choice. There is just the future. And it's whether you're along for the ride or not. Now I need to shave. So I'll come back, and try again in a minute. I wish the sun was rising right now. I wish it was blasting through my window. Because if it were blasting through my window, I'd be able to say to you, with a beautiful light coming through, that I'm not crazy and I need you to fucking listen for a minute, world. A lot of people out there have a lot of things to say about technology, about AI. I, in my hand, have a stack of papers that have nothing to do with AI in this hand. And they're in this room, in one of my stacks. I have a lot. And I can find them in a moment. But the point is, is that the case I'm involved in, which is roughly six binders right now, each about 3,000 pages each, which is for the, the control of my house. I'm in a long process of my house that I took in adverse possession, which is controversial, right? He adversely does it. He's a squatter. Well, my neighbors didn't think so. My neighbors thought I was actually quite wonderful, and my wife too, because we fixed a house that had been abandoned for 30 years, and we took it and brought it back to life, and it made a community garden with it by donating the yard and giving it the right to a uh, con conservation easement to stop it from its development as you know uh, conservation easement of a property is uh, an attempt to stop property development and to allow animals to live in the area with a uh, control of of protection that is in an endowment you provide money so that you can protect the laws that you've invoked on this land for its natural protection and habitat because you have to actually guard it. You have to physically implement the strategies of lawsuit uh, against people who violate it. People who would kill hummingbirds, kill you know mountain lions, things like that. So we start the experimental Japanese garden in this property that's abandoned for 30 years. And it turns out why it's so lucky for us. Because we could have missed by a hair. Anything could have gone wrong. And the only thing that went wrong was everybody was corrupt in the middle. I mean, I'm talking the judges, the lawyers, the parties involved, the 15 parties that bought it before. And, and why? Because it's a hillside. Subpar building from eight, 1900 that um, is on a hillside regulated hill in the middle of a steep incline without any sidewalk or curb that would allow water to drain properly with the requirements of the landowners on that street to build and pay for the street because of the city's fucked up policies. The fact that Mayor Garcetti lived a half a block away was actually part of it. He kept on vacating every single piece of space that was around that property, his, and anything near him, so that the city wouldn't have to pay for any of the upgrades because it was another way to basically dump costs and expenditures out the window that were necessary to keep the city in its good 
habit and think that neighborhoods like Elysian Heights can afford to pay for their own crazy streets on hills that are switchbacks just like Sunset Plaza Drive. Does Sunset Plaza Drive's neighbors pay for their own streets? I wonder. Does Bel Air's? I hope so. Because in Elysian Heights, our streets have fallen apart. Sidewalks have fallen off the edge. Homeless, sorry, not homeless. People in wheelchairs with, what do you call it? Um, not cerebral palsy, but uh, quad quadriplegics. In particular, with a gyroscopic wheelchair, Paul Bowers, he can't get up and down the block, and he, like a thousand other people, go to the top of the street every single day to go see the sunset, because that's his thing that he does with his kid. And Paul is a radical, man. He's fighting for those cracked streets to be fixed. He is the least handicapped person I know in a wheelchair, in a very, very serious situation. He used to ride motorcycles. It wasn't like he was born like that. And I don't think that's how he got the wheelchair in his life full time. But I've been in his house and the whole thing's set up with ramps and rails and it's for the flats, you know. He wants to play music more, but he's he's got a child that he takes care of and it's uh, and he's in a divorce and he has a back house. But, you know, it's hard to rent it on Airbnb because you try and rent on Airbnb a house that's custom designed for a wheelchair man. He's a fucking motherfucker. I love Paul. He tried to get me into city council at a wrong time for my city council because my city council was corrupt as well. It had a different kind of corruption. I think it would be called bigotry. People putting nooses around their front yard lawn jockeys and things like that at a time when we we're being all ultra politically correct. But let's stick to the chore here. It's outlining this serious issue. The city council removes my house from REAP after it's suggested to be. My house is in REAP, Rent Escrow Adjustment Program. It's a thing where you have substandard housing from people who are tenants or landlord and tenants and that weren't taking care of the property. Except for this property had a landlord and his nephew living there and they had been, what do you call that, um, predatory mortgage lended to, which is a lender liability. It's not a lender liability, it's a lender crime. He had it free and clear. He's a second owner after Ann, Ann Rigatti from 1910. Fred Medell, Fred Medell and his family. And they, they somehow get into a $10,000 debt that turns to a 250k debt over a fucking very short period of time. But it should have never happened because it's an RSO, Rent Stabilized Ordinance, okay? And so this isn't about me, the long story. I'm not here to pitch you why I'm right. I'm here to pitch you, let me tell you now, why AI is right. Why I've removed corruption from the system if you'll allow it to be tested out in one CD. CD 14, which is the... Council District 14, or no, I'd like Council District 13 because I can guarantee the corruption on a systemic level already. And I know it's in 14 because I moved there after I lost my house temporarily to a hotel called the Mariachi Plaza run by the Altman Apartments, which is another conman in Los Angeles' property um, machinations who uh, buys up buildings with 30 units in them and then he runs uh, tap tap gambling rooms in them and then you know stocks them full of gangsters. And then they enjoy the tap tap gambling room because it gives them a profit margin that's pretty damn fun and um, ultimately he also rents on Airbnb and to people like me from the uh, you know different travel sites and then if you're in there for more than a 28 day stay it's the you know 20 day shuffle so he tries to make sure everybody moves but if you shuffle in the same building it doesn't fucking matter it's still a continuous stay but they'll lie to you and tell you other things and what they really do is they just bring guys with guns that are private security to drag you out by your sheets bully the shit out of you and throw you on the street in an automatic eviction that had no right or bearing maybe holding up a piece of paper that says 24-hour notice to vacate, which isn't a legal idea. You have a 24-hour notice to inspect, but not to vacate. And you would have to have permits and procedures that were to do an upgrade, and, and, and none of this was that way for me, and I faced the same thing, and so did 40 other people, including all of the Primera flats that were there. And, and because I'm a white kid, I was like, fuck it, man. We don't have any respect here unless we do something about it, and we know how. My wife knew how. And what we did is we went and filed an injunction, a uh, temporary restraining order, and we got it. It was amazing. But before I even got out of the cab, I saw my shit flying out the window of the building. My wife screaming bloody murder and fucking, it wasn't even just a security guard and Freddy, the fucking management, and the, it wasn't any of the people that were our you know, neighbors, the guests, the uh, Primera dudes, they were all rad, but they also were scared of the gang injunctions. So so that would be applied to them and the way that things go down and they'd end up in jail just for even walking on the street between the two buildings because they get caught up in in sweeps for their probation and whatnot you know they gotta stay hidden because they're in their own neighborhood and the injunction from 2014 really fucks over people that live in their own neighborhood 
because they're not allowed to live there anymore, which is some bullshit. And practicing or not, 30 or not, you know, the way is done. They're they're now on to LSD rather than fucking hard drugs, you know. They're having families. The thing is, is that the security was backed up by maids swinging brooms like fucking the Velvet Underground song goes um I can't stand Andy Warhol I can't stand him anymore more but if something will come back it will be all right my landlord hit me with a mop it was a something a cat with and it had and a, and a spat with nine ten dead cats you know I can't sing the song I don't remember but that's Andy Warhol he's the he's the mop and being hit with the mop is like him throwing it at you and he says, I can't stand Andy. I can't stand Andy Warhol any more and more because there was a conflict between their egos at the end of the day. Warhol could make money quickly. Lou needed it. Lou was a pretentious avant-gardist. Andy Warhol was a pretentious avant-gardist that could be aloof and productive at a hardcore level. He would come in and say to Lou, have you done... 15 songs a day and Lou would say no I did 10 and Andy would be like oh that's just not good enough you should have done 15 you could have done that's you could have done better and they got into this fucking mindset of being like you know I'm not good enough what the fuck I'm Lou Reed it's bullshit so they start singing I can't stand Andy Warhol I can't stand him anymore and more so what I'm baffled by is these Mexican maids these little ladies that are nice on the front end after they're paid money by a fucking gangster fucking he's not a gangster but he, the mindset of a Italian gangster in this Sam Altman character who runs buildings in San Pedro in Boyle Heights and I know in other neighborhoods but I need to go reinvest myself into that and they're basically leveraging the fucking fear factor between the tenants and you can get a room for as cheap as 38 bucks a night if you're friends with Freddy but usually 50 and um, they really just wanted to rent to the people who would pay for the tap tap gambling rooms, enough of them, so that they had the whole second floor leveraged, because they would make a shit ton more money with the tap tap gambling room running, and that was the real meat and potatoes. So having us tenants at the regular rate wasn't paying the bill in the way that they wanted it to be. So it was much better for them to do a supposed remodel on the whole thing, kick us all out, and then go into the slow process of doing what would be a rehabilitation of the building and COVID kind of caused that and I'd say that was a good aspect but they needed to do it legitimately with permits and procedures and notices and and then deal with the fact that they'd actually put us in there too long and fall not follow the rules that would have kept them in the safe you know it's just the way things are you need to follow the rules and when you have that many gangsters in the building which I'm on the side of in this conversation you're gonna have some issues too because normally you'd see these things like um city attorneys notice about like this building is occupied by the certain type of habitat in life and it creates a conflict for the community and there's a lot of yeah that kind of thing and they, they exist this problem is in the news systemically and continuously in certain neighborhoods just like this one but that's not what was going to go down here what I'm was going to go down was everybody was going to leave without any rights and they didn't care because they had no choice so I went and got that restraining order and while everyone else that was still sticking it out, and it was really just Cameron and me and my wife, there was, you know, 40 units abandoned and everybody was moving to the building next door. They could have told us we could have gotten a room next door, we would have done it. But we just had no choice. We just got into that second room. We were in the room across the hall. Now we had the bigger one, and we were working on our case. And we were at the crux of our case, where our case for our house would have been easy to win right then and there. We just needed to finish some filings. We got real internet installed for ourselves, like actual you know, cable internet, which you're not supposed to do, but we were made sure everybody was <laughs> on our side so we could all use it. So Freddy's on one side of the building, the internet guy's on the other side of the building. It doesn't really matter. Those kinds of rules are ridiculous. It wasn't about holding the building hostage. It was about having the internet that worked because they would promise it and it didn't work at all, never. And we needed it to win our case. So... We had to be out in like 15 minutes, and it wasn't our choice. We didn't have a way to carry our shit down. They literally put us on the sheets, dragged it at its corners, had one security guard hold a gun out and pointed at us, and he'd say to us, it's not my decision, man, I'm sorry. It's just my job, that's what I'm paid to do. Like, you're paid to fucking violate our civil rights? It's so fucked in the head. So I ran to the Hollenbeck station in the middle trying to get some attention, because it's about 
it's, it's a good two football fields, but I ran it. And you know what happened? Nothing. They didn't even come. Not even once. They didn't even come at all. They drove by over and over, looked at us in the street with our shit being dumped on the street oh. like we had done something wrong and ignored me as I said, hey, help, help, you know? We're stuck there overnight in the street in Boyle Heights as it gets to four in the morning. It's getting scary, you know? Finally, an Uber finally shows up for us that we've been calling for for fucking five hours. And we'd rented through Airbnb a temporary spot in the Delphi. Delphi is next, uh, is Delphi? No, in the, um, the, the one next to the Delphi, which is standard is the Delphi, so I don't remember the name of it, but it's one building next to it, it's identical in design, essentially, and, uh, as the standard building, and, uh, like Dolphin or something. We get, uh, a lockbox that's several blocks away on a corner that's weird. Uh, the instructions are to get the key from the lockbox, and it has a clicker, you know, like a fob, and that'll let you into the lower garage. And so we follow the rules and think, hey, that's cool. I should have looked slightly careful, like more careful, because the person who rented to us, his last name was Hilton. Well, that should have been suspicious, but it was a couple, and it's just, you know, it's a common last name, I suppose. And it wasn't an unreasonable, unreasonably cheap fare. It was like 200 bucks. And we get there, and it's a duplicated fob, evidently. The key is not a key to the door. The reviews for it have some people getting in, and they all say that it's not as clean as it said it would be. But when I look at the photos and compare them to the building itself, it's not the same pool, it's not the same building, it's not the same apartment. The key doesn't work, the fob's the only thing that works, and when the security finally discovers that we have moved a, there's a reason for this, a two-bedroom house into the garage, because we had been evicted illegally from our home and had brought a van load, a Ford one, uh, no. a, he has a Ford Econoline 1968, full to the brim, my friend Daniel Resch's, of our stuff that we had salvaged from the trashing and damage that we had done to us by the Shapiro family. And that was to last us three months because in the first week of being ejected from our house before we were taken hostage again for another 93 days or something just long enough to keep us from an appeal we were locked in a backyard with a chain link fence a chained in metal door a chained in backyard um, with no windows and bars over the what were little you know air slots with six cats that needed to be changed of their litter and the ammonia was so insanely burning that we were basically delusional after a few weeks to get fed like twice a week and it was um, people that were friends with that had been basically blackmailed by Scientology that initially were there to help us and then changed their mind and it's unbelievable but we finally kicked up a skunk you know stink we made a pain in the ass out of ourselves knocked the pipes loose Cut the electricity. We fucking got ourselves let out for being a nightmare. Huh? Fucking yelling at the top yeah. of our lungs for fucking, fucking causing mad havoc because we needed to fucking live our lives. And we'd also waited just long enough to get our some of our money released that we had available. We had 26 grand available and we used it to go to a hotel and we started at the Ace, which is a nice place. But my wife and I had just been married in 2020 on uh, February 28th or 9th, the leap year day. And the whole time we're in COVID, we're being sued. The whole time we're going through COVID, we never have a chance to have our family over or have a marriage, do anything for our marriage. It's just war, you know, in court. And we win, but at the loss of losing all that time that everyone got free to organize their lives, all that time that people got to save their money, we were fucking spending it on court fees and fucking just getting annihilated and building our house. That was the good part. So we treated ourselves to six days and it wasn't intentional either. We actually booked this thing called the Bubeshko, which is a Rudolph Schindler apartment in Los Feliz, Silver Lake. It's a small 300 square foot apartment and it's art historically correct to our study in college. And we did this because it was our, our wedding present to ourself. It was a $5,000 a month spot. For 90 days is all we wanted it for. That would be long enough for us to fit in our filings and 
essentially get our injunction and take our house back. After the booking of it, the guy who says uh, there's running it says, I need to make a change with you. So we acknowledge it and just go along with it because we, what are we going to do about it, right? One hour before we're supposed to move in, he cancels our whole thing with a steward of Airbnb. No reason why. None whatsoever. We're on, we're like four minutes away from the property with the van full of our stuff that it took all day to move into with our friend Daniel helping us and his wife's like got, you know, he and his wife have three children. So it's this never ending journey this day. And we're fucked. So we're sitting in front of Daniel's house all fucking day, right? It's actually night trying to figure out what to do. We call and make another booking. So they take our money. And so we're now out uh, at the Ace again, the only place that has any space at that point. We just try to go right back in. We have a cat too, you know. Um, I'll tell you about that later. So anyway, uh, they take our money and then we get there and they say, oh, no, we, we can't, there's no rooms. What the fuck? They tell us some other places. We check them out. Nothing works out. We finally go to the building across the street from where I'm at now, the Western Bonaventure. Right, and the Western Bonaventure at five in the morning has this nice um, count, uh, cash register person, whatever you call it, for a hotel, concierge. This guy's young my age, and he's here's my plea, gets us a room, and we're in immediately. We have to unload the Van, we have four carts, take six loads, no one sees, we're good to go. Jesus Christ, we fucking made it in. We end up becoming Bon V Platinum members, which is like the hotel, the Marriott's, you know, way to save money. Well, it's really not a way to save money. If they wanted to help us, we would have been properly directed to a long-term stay manager because we asked every time and we never were. On the second day, our room flooded. I don't want to skip this whole part, but our room flooded. Our clothes were soaked. We didn't know because the closet was soaked from the floor up. The clothes were on the floor because we just moved in. Didn't have time or energy to care at first. Then we noticed we were walking in water. And then they, after pushing for it, we asked for a dry cleaning or that's what we asked for. What happens is they pick up the clothes and they put it in the washer and dryer. And what is it? Suits, kimonos, Chanel outfits, Dior suits. Like I'm talking the best pieces of clothes that we had left out of the 120 feet of clothing we had cumulative of like show show clothing and runway stuff, Prêt-à-Porter and couture from being in fashion for like half our lives. Um, we had probably like 10 feet left of clothes. No, not even that. Like six. Cumulative. Stacked tight. But all of that was thrown into a washer and dryer and shrunk and destroyed to utter annihilation. And it's just like, are you insane, you guys? Like, this is fucking stupid. Like, you're the Western Bonaventure. I saw you have a dry cleaner on the fifth floor of your fucking little mini mall that's inside the building. And we make a complaint, a letter... They give us an insurance form and <laughs> their insurance company's lawyer tries to fuck us over and like still hasn't answered any claim. So I'm going to take them to court. And um, we asked for compensation so far on the room. We get promised it a $1,900 comp and they uh, do a $200 comp and then take a $400 deposit. And then they do this on a daily basis, taking another $200 every single day and deposit on top of the last deposit, never releasing the deposit ever. We ended up at like a $10,000 deposit with no release on the deposit ever. And you look at their reviews carefully. If you screen them, you'll see this is a process that they do. And they hold out and if you call for months and months and months, you'll never get your money released. The only person I've seen successful at it was Phil Spector. He had to pull some serious shit in court to fucking not be scammed. And I think this was during the COVID in particular. I mean, I'm sure it's still happening, but at COVID, it was the epitome of it. And so uh, we're there 45 days in the last five or so. We didn't pay anything, and the police had to come, and the police sided with us. But when it's the last day, when we said we'd leave anyway, because it's just out of hand how much they're stressing us out and not working with us. Meanwhile, we're on the phone with Airbnb the entire time trying to get the money back from Airbnb, the five grand initially, plus um, 
it costs us a ton of money in the middle to lose everything, like the the gas, the time, the packing, the the, the stays, the deposits, the fucking holds, and we're basically out. Oh, and the extra six days. So the whole point was is that we had to stay there six days till we could start in the Bubeshko, even though we'd already paid, right? So this guy cancels our thing. It turns out he's a renter, and he's subletting illegally. He has another apartment in New York, and he's subletting that too, and he jumps back and forth, but he has real landlords, and they work at uh, KCRW, and it's a real like radio broadcast journalist. It's well known, I think, in like something like an All Things Considered. I can't remember the name of the show. <coughs> and they own the Bubeshko building, and there are wonderful people who have been invested into restoring the building, and they have no idea that their tenant is doing a mastermind fucking sublet scheme, and he's got people coming and going, pissing off the rest of the neighbors, because this is architectural heritage, and all we wanted to do was stay in a Rudolf Schindler building so we could um, appreciate the architecture, because we were architecture students. Uh, you know, I went to art school, and we were trying to go to Taliesin West, which we did for a minute, and... Um, it was just supposed to be this thing where we could study from learning it from living with it and we really deserved it in our opinion that was what we wanted to do with our own money was treat ourselves seeing that our house was stolen from us to something that would give us internal knowledge of the machination of the type of pocket living that um, Rudolf Schindler designed in this stacked architecture in this building change our lives Rudolf Schindler's amazing Anyway, um, it's goddamn fucking genius of fucking using space like a cave and a tent at the same time, stacking things in multi layers and using materials in ways you've never seen, and opening it up to kind of multi dimensional, multi family property with an open floor plan. It's, it's, it's mind boggling. Anyway, so back to my house. So, um, I could go on and on, but we won the case, right? They get a new one. They get a judge, the same judge, to tell them tricks of law, which he's not allowed to give law advice, and he gives them le illegal advice to um, file a false claim um, duplicate set of uh, suits that have um, a fake address on one, and ultimately to get a default on that fake address and then file it in both cases and collapse the case, and he'll give them a default, right, for us, because we never got it. And so he won't let us have the vacate because he's going to make sure they win. and. He instructs them this in the ruling, essentially, and in um, communications that are off the record that he's guilty for. I mean, you can listen to the recordings, and I highly recommend it. They're on SoundCloud already. And um, George F. Byrd Jr., he's a corrupt son of a bitch. And we have Collar S. Upinder, Stephanie Bowick, Teresa Boudot, Gail Califer, Collar S. Upinder, George F. Byrd Jr., Uh, a Japanese judge in 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 uh, Chatsworth, and um, the TRO judges, and another TRO judge, and another TRO judge. I can't name them because I should be able to, but uh, that's a lot of judges just for me. And then, so the people before me, they're being sued for mortgage fraud in Rico, which is Stephen William Schneider and his crew of mortgage frauders that run a private money loan business that takes your loan application and submits it to Lending Home. Lending Home, on the other hand, is a lender liability company that gave him seven or eight million dollars at once because they're fucking trying to get the default on lender, uh, what do you call it, predatory mortgage lending. Stephen William Snyder is fake producer as well for films. He'll get people like Martin Sheen to act in his commercial that he's supposedly shooting, and it is then cut into a trailer. The trailer is then used to pitch to wannabe producers to give Snyder a lot of money. Snyder will then in turn take that money and use it to fund his private money loan, and then say he's giving them interest in property, and they never get their documents, and the relationship kind of crumbles, and he makes films with a you know a high end red camera or something and it they suck unfortunately he has good intent but he's I mean no he doesn't have good intent but his, his intent keeps growing and out of control to the point where because he's my age to he starts this thing called Sakura Blossom and Sakura Blossom is this pretty evil little pitch about uh, capitalizing your money in like 12 months on 20 million or something it's some bullshit I'll play it for you I'd love to but um yeah I'll stop there. It's 27 minutes, and we're going to give you a little Sakura Blossom, and then we'll come right back. Sakura. 
the cherry blossom. They emerge for a few weeks a year, bursting out of dormancy, forming a sea of various pink hues that transfix her audience. As quickly as they arrive, they wither away, just a fleeting glimpse for us to witness their magnificence. A beautiful metaphor, a sign, a reminder that our lives are also brief and that we should live them with the same intoxicating spectacle of joy and fervor like the Sakura. Freedom, abundance. We should be the blossom. Yet, we get caught up on what we think matters. We spend our time working, trying to make money, chasing that life, that luxury, that abundance, that dream. But time is money. So we're literally spending money to make money. A hamster wheel we can't escape. Running towards a life we can't attain. A perpetual cycle of chaos. But it's out of the darkest chaos that the most beautiful things emerge. We at Sakura Blossom have innovated a new concept to bring forth an opportunity for the 99% that they will have an abundant luxury lifestyle at a fraction of the price. The message is noble and surely respected, but when you couple the financial projections of this concept, where we take $20 million of real estate to a valuation of over 160 million in just 12 months, that equates out to a 43% capitalization rate. And we look to double that in the next year. When you take all of those financial projections and couple them along with the fact that Blossom is spreading joy and happiness and hope and self-worth to the people around it, that is when you realize just how unique and shiny and bright Blossom truly is. Let's live again. Let's laugh more. Let's relax and be grateful. Let's work hard and play hard. Let's build a community for fun. Let's cherish the moment we are in. Let's shine bright. Let's be the blossom.